place to help these people. Okay. I better write this up on the board so I don't get in trouble. I'm on page 44. Oh, you are? Yep. Was it? It was in English, right? Yeah. It was. Oh. Yeah, I, I kind of felt like it was written in English. You, you could like feel that English sense, but it wasn't it wasn't quite there. It's like, Greek. It, it was not. It's not Greek. It's like English. I, I had Mandarin. It was a little weird. Oh yeah. Okay. 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 So who are the three authors? Hamilton, John, James, and Good question on a test, didn't it? Okay. What's that? Okay. Oh, history, you'll get lots of them. Okay. Lots of them. Yeah. All right. So, Federalist number one. Uh, we've got Alexander Hamilton. Now, remember, I don't know if you remember this. I didn't know if I told you this. They used a pen name. They did not put their name. This is written by Alexander Hamilton. Why would Hamilton use a pen name and say, instead of taking credit for writing it? He was a bastard child, and he was abrasive, cocky, and a lot of people didn't like him. He's one of those people you either love him or you hate him. You know what I mean? I like Trump. Yeah. Some people love him. Some people hate him. I guess there's some people in between, but you know, it's kind of the way I see it. Okay. Um, yeah, he's kind of a divisive figure. And you want to kind of try and keep politics out of this. So does anybody know what the pen name they use? Publius. Publius, which means citizen. Okay. Uh, or citizen of New York in this case. Would be Hamilton from New York. Madison's not from New York. Madison's from Virginia. Jay is a New Yorker. Who's John Jay? What's he going to become? The first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Okay. What does Hancock become? Governor of Massachusetts. Okay. What does John Adams become? Eventually become vice president, but he's ambassador to Britain during this time. Jefferson's ambassador to France, right? Okay. Now, Hamilton is writing a, it's the first one. So, do you kind of get a feel like this is a uh, introduction of sorts? Did anything jump out to anybody about this paper? Like, this is the true impact of it. What's going on here? Aggressive. Yeah, it is. Towards who? Like, who's he directing this at? Like, who's he, like, calling out? He's calling somebody out. Anti-Federalist. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're in the third paragraph there? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's look at that third paragraph, okay? It says, among the most formidable obstacles of which the new Constitution will have to encounter, may readily be distinguished the obvious interests of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution of the power, which diminish their power, okay? Emulent in consequence of the offices they hold under state establishments and the perverted ambition of another class of men who will hope to either aggrandize themselves by the confusions of our country or will flatter themselves with fairer prospects of elevation from the subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies than to form its union under one government. He is calling out 
the men of the state legislatures. Okay, he's he's saying these people they want to hold on to their power. Well, now can you blame them? Now he's saying they're doing it for ambitious reasons. They like they seek to hold this power even if it's going to destroy the country. So he's kind of giving you like. You're either with these guys that don't care about the country, or you're with these guys that, you know, they can hold on to their power. Kind of where he's going with that. You know what I mean? It is forceful. Okay, turn the page. And we drop down to the second paragraph on page 45. It will be forgotten, as the third line down. It will be forgotten on one hand that jealousy is the usual commitment. Somebody say that word for me. Concomitant. Yeah, let's start over. It will be forgotten on one hand that jealousy is the usual concomitant of violent love, and that the noble enthusiasm of liberty is too apt to be infected with the spirit of narrow, illiberal distrust. That's a handful. On the other hand, it will equally be forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, that in the contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interests can never be separated. So if you can't defend liberty, your interests are tied to that. You have to be able to defend that liberty, and that a dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the suspicious Vicious? What's that word? Say Vicious? 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 Mask of zeal for the rights of the people, then under the forbidding appearance of zeal uh, for the firmness and efficiency of government. Okay, so I think what he's trying to tie there, and guys, it is difficult to understand. He's trying to tie the fact that a strong government, a stronger government will ensure our liberty. It will defend our freedoms better, okay, than the chaos that may ensue without it, okay? And this is strong language, uh, for sure, okay? All right, let's jump to the second one, John Jay. This is the only one I provided with you, John Jay. Uh, general thoughts on Federalist Number 2. Like, what is Jay describing here? This is something you guys have studied. It sounds like John Locke. And what was John Locke writing? It was a what? Yeah, he's describing a social contract that we need a new one. Right? There's no second paragraph. First paragraph said this is an important question. And then second paragraph, nothing is more certain than the indispensable necessity of government. Yes, we need it. And it's equal unattain equally unattain undeniable, excuse me, that whenever and however it is instituted, the people must see to it some of their natural rights in order to vest with it requisite powers. It is well worthy of consideration, therefore, whether it would conduce more of the interest of the people of America that they should, to all general purposes, be one nation under one federal government then they should divide themselves into separate confederacies and to give each and to give to the head of each the same kind of powers which they are advised to place in one national government. Okay, so just this argument of a new social contract moving away from a confederal system into a one federal government, okay? Just pointing out to people that may not understand what is going on. This needs to be considered. Okay, and then Federalist number 10, which, guys, is probably the most famous of all the 85, is number 10, okay? And we may get lost on this one for a while, okay? Because there's some really important stuff in this paper, stuff that we need to be reminded of today, things that affect the decisions we make, okay? So in this paper, he talks a lot about Factions, right? And by the way, Madison's writing 
I don't know how many of you guys actually read this, but this is this is eloquent. It is extremely well read. Um, so when you were reading this, what when he was talking about factions, what came to mind for you guys? Okay, political parties, right? Now, in actuality, it gets a little deeper than that, than just political parties. What we call today interest group. Or in a negative light, the media will awful, often return to the, uh, refer to these as special interest groups or special interests. Okay. Now, the reality is, guys, as Madison describes, we all form our own factions based on the way we feel about things. Yes? So everybody in this room, when you become an adult and you get out, you may join different factions in society. Let me throw out a couple that you might be familiar with. Not the National Recovery Administration. Oh, that's the first thing I thought of. Yes. Yeah. The National Rifle Association, yes? Okay. This is one of the most powerful interest groups in the country today. These people make and break political campaigns by funding them and helping fund candidates that support the Second Amendment right to bear arms and fewer restrictions on those, okay? But are there anti-gun groups as well? Huh? That's, that's, I don't know. They're, yeah, they're that's a government agency, okay? This, these are private interest groups. Let me, let me throw in one that a lot of you have probably heard of. You know this one, Mariah? People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, okay? Now, any uh, ladies, gentlemen, you guys like to wear cologne, perfume? Perfume? You go out on a date, going to prom, I'm going to put on a perfume. Okay. Yeah. You know where they test perfume, what they test those on, oftentimes? Huh? Bunny rabbits. Okay? They shave the bunny rabbits. Okay? Peter feels like this is inhumane. Okay, so a lot of times, guys, when you buy cosmetics or perfumes, it'll say on the box whether this was animal tested or not. Okay? Because some people will not buy it if it was tested on animals. Okay? This is a big group for that. They raise a lot of money. And they have an impact. You ever heard of this? Yeah. The American Association of Retired People. This is a very powerful interest group. Okay. They can make or break your campaign. Okay. Um, Ever heard of this? U.S. Chamber of Member of Commerce. Okay, guys, if you are a business owner um, at a local level in Wichita, there is a Wichita Chamber of Commerce. Okay, and so what you do is you join, you pay dues, and um, you get together like once a month with other business people in the community and swap business cards and talk and do business at the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce promotes businesses with the government. Like, they promote the things that businesses want, like cheap labor. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is all about immigration, whether it's legal or illegal. They're all about it. Right? Because businesses, guys, labor is expensive. If you can pay people less, 
Good for business. Okay. You guys heard of this? Okay, so when you look at environmental groups, uh, ones that promote, you know, uh, conserve, conservation, uh, green energy, this sort of thing, the Sierra Club is a very uh, viable, powerful interest group when it comes to environmental issues, okay? Uh, you ever heard of this one? It's an interest group, okay? Now, some of these interest groups you would support, and some of these interest groups you may not support, okay? Um, I have joined the M NRA. I'm not a, like a lifetime member or anything like that, but there's been like two years, two different separate years where I've joined it when I felt like the uh, NRA and Second Amendment rights were under attack. I spent the $25 to become a member. Send you a little pocket knife, magazine subscription, maybe a duffel bag, something like that. Which $25 book. Okay. More of a political statement than anything else. Okay. Uh, but guys, this, this organization has billions of men, which means they have hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. Now, so would you agree that you would support some of these and others you may not? Yeah. So in the modern era, what this means, guys, is a lot of money. Did you say there's too much money in Washington, D.C. in politics? Yeah. This midterm election, the two parties and interest groups have spent, I saw this the other day, I talked about it in one of my classes. Was, this, was it this class? Yeah. It was something like six. Uh, no, it's like $6.9 billion. And they're expecting close to be over $9 billion before the election in 40. Okay. The most expensive midterm election in our history. Now, let's look at what Madison says about this, okay? By a faction, and I'm on the second paragraph, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, are united and actuated by some common impulse or passion or interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Okay, so if you think, like, Gun control is a problem, like guns are a big problem, okay? And you're against this. You're against, you know, people having access to weapons like this, okay? You might be upset about this, okay? Um, and these interest groups, would you say 51% of Americans would support the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, a majority of Americans today? Yeah, that's pretty safe to say. Would you say all of them support the NRA? No. But you'd say more than half say we should be allowed to have guns. Okay. So people that live in inner city areas where there is high rates of gun violence, this goes against their interests, some may say. Yes? Okay. Others might say, well, wait a second. Get a gun to defend yourself if you live in one of those high crime areas, and you may not become a victim. Okay, so having access to a weapon to protect yourself is more important. Whatever. Okay, there are two methods of curing the mischief of faction. The one by removing its causes. Now, in this case, we don't necessarily have to talk about guns. We can talk about money. So, does all this special interest money? control our politicians in Washington and in Topeka. So how do we, two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction, the one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. This is brilliant. There again, there are two methods of 
removing the causes of faction, the one by destroying the liberty, which is essential to his, his existence. Don't allow it. Now, if I give $25 to the Donald Trump re-election campaign, or to one of these interest groups, I am acting under the First Amendment right of free what? Speech. The Supreme Court has said your funding, your money, your donation is an extension of speech. So in order to curtail the mischiefs of all this money in our politics, you would destroy what amendment? First Amendment, taking away your liberty to participate with these interest groups. Are you following? Okay. Now, we don't like it. We don't like all this money in here. And you would like to elect people that you think would not be swayed by this money. But we're human beings, aren't we? Okay. The other is by giving every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Well, you could try in a communist. Now, when we study Hitler in history, guys, we'll learn about the Hitler Youth and the Hitler education curriculum that every teacher had to join the Hitler uh, teachers organization. And they all teach the same exact thing to every student in Germany. We could do that in the United States. We could have every teacher indoctrinate students into the same ideology, giving them the same interests, the same passions as each other. Uh, you could try it. Has there been any controversy about what's being taught in our schools in the last year or so? Oregon trying to argue with math is suggesting. Oh my God. <laughs> Wait, what? No way. Dude, they're doing away with valedictorians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's because our society, everybody's a winner. So. That's uh, What do you got, Sarah? Oh. Math is racist. Yeah, at some point it was because they were deciding like high if you couldn't if you were really good at math you couldn't take a higher level math class because yeah. that you're you're too privileged and other people aren't. No honors class. Hey Don, somebody's gonna get canceled. This is insanity. It's insanity. Okay, now the good thing is <laughs> you're screwed. If you can afford it, if you can afford it, you can get out of those schools. Now, you guys are privileged here to go under the stewardship system, right? But you're the only one in the whole freaking country. Isn't that amazing? I think it's pretty neat. I tell my cousins, because so I have a bunch of Catholic cousins in, in Columbus, the Enrights, okay? Ebright's married into the Enrights. Guys. <laughs> no. Hey, wait. Yeah, no my way dad's you sister, Marge Ebright, married Tom Enright. And they had five kids, and they have a bunch of kids. These are my cousins. Okay. They're awesome. Tom Enright, man, my uncle, Irish Catholic, played the jazz band, Korean War vet. He was the bomb, man. I miss that guy. But Marge is still alive, so. Um, that's my only link to my family. Everybody else is gone. Um, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sad too. That made me sad. Um, what, what, what are we talking about? Only stewardship. Yeah, yeah, yes. No, you have a choice. You get out, you know, and, and they're trying to create that in some other states, the school choice stuff that we talked about early on in the class. Okay. So uh, Kansas is not ready for that, but um, actually, aren't we? No, aren't we going to open enrollment in Kansas? Yeah, I think you can change schools. There's no vouchers. But now, if you play sports, you still got to sit out. But you can transfer school. Yes, yes, yes. That's new. There's also a rule you can switch yeah. sports and you can't play for a season or Yeah, you can play JV, but you can't. So, yeah. 
It hopefully prevents like recruiting by uh, by school. Yeah, if you move, if you physically move, you can participate. Yeah. But you know, sometimes, you know, sports and stuff are important to family. Yeah. I'm like consumed by it. My daughter's playing college, I can't think about anything else. She's got a big game tonight. All right. Oh yeah. Play Mount St. Joseph, and they're pretty good. Um, they're in near the top. Right? They were picked second in the league, so we were picked ninth. But we're two and zero. Oh. Let's go. I talked to my daughter today, and she doesn't even know who they're playing. I, can, I care way more about the this than she does. It's silly, <laughs> but I'm having fun. You know what I mean? I'm on the computer looking up stats and stuff. I know who their best players are on the other team. Like, scout. You know, going home, get the TV set up, the live stream. You know, maybe going to cook some burgers. I was thinking about some shrimp, maybe. Nice nice. dinner and eat breaks. Surf and turf. Let's go. Yeah, Goats, so man. Fighting engineers. Let's go. All right, now, back to this. Sorry. Uh, now, I love the way he writes this, okay? It could never be more truly said than of the first remedy, that it's worse than the disease. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire. An ailment without, it is instantly expired. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life, because it nourishes faction than it would be to annihilate wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. Just because this pisses us off, this money, it makes us upset that Washington's a bunch of corrupt politicians, we can't destroy our own liberties. Now, if Bill Gates or George Soros decides to donate millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, do I have that kind of money to compete with George Soros and Bill Gates or Charles Koch? No, but guess what? You and I all join together. We can compete with them. Well, not just you and I, but your parents and your cousins and your cousin's cousins. We have a group. We have a group. Strength in numbers. Okay, so guys, they've tried to place limits on campaign donations. Okay, and for for some people, this is very angry because there was a Supreme Court case that came out about ten years ago. You'll hear it mentioned from time to time. It was called Citizens United, and guys, you guys know what a labor union is, right? So the largest teachers union in America is called the National Education Association. And in many states, it's very encouraged for you, if you're a public school teacher, to join the NEA, which means you pay monthly dues to this organization, which means this organization has a lot of money to spend on what? Candidates. candidates. Now, the vast majority of candidates that the NEA supports come from one political party, yes? Democrat, okay? Democrats are in bed with the teachers' union. Okay, now they're a lot. I'm not a member of the NEA. The NEA doesn't care about students. No, they care about teachers. What do I care about? I care about you. Yeah. Also, yeah, <laughs> couldn't you not join the NEA because you're not a public school teacher? Oh, I could join it, but they wouldn't represent me here. So like 259 actually negotiates with the teachers. Okay, so like my buddy Tom that teaches over there is not a member of the union, but he benefits from it. Okay. Um, you used to until until 2017, they could force you to join the union in some states. Like if you lived in California and you were a public school teacher, you had to join the union. 
there was a Supreme Court case called Janus in 2017 that said you could not force government workers to join a union. Okay, uh, that's relatively new. He's trying to fix my lock. Uh, I can barely get my key. Pretty much come to school and I can't get in my room for zero hours. You know what I mean? That be, um, Did you get my message? I don't know. Okay, no zero hour tomorrow. Sleep in. Sweet. I got I got principal's council meeting. I'm gonna go this time. I'm gonna go this time. Okay. I'll put out a video. Um, you don't have to worry about me. Yeah. Tomorrow I'll put out a video. We got nothing to see. Okay. Sorry. What are we talking about? Okay, now listen. So no, yeah, so unions, guys, unions have always been allowed to give to campaign. You with me? Okay. Then corporations wanted to give money. And people are like, you can't have these biz big businesses giving money to campaigns. That's not right. They're not people. They're an organization. Well, Citizens United decision about 10 years ago said, well, no, actually, corporations are made up of people. And therefore, corporations can give money to. Okay. This just like, you just got a lot more money in politics. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's ugly right now. Now. I do want to, I want, I want to throw this at you. Okay. Let's say I decide to run for the house. I'm going to, I'm going to take Ron as to see from the, for the fourth district. Okay. In 2024, let's say I'm going to run. Okay. Now I am pro second amendment. Okay. Now the NRA hears that I'm running and they hear that I'm pro second amendment. Okay. They're going to send me a check for my campaign. Yes. Now, if I get elected, did the NRA just buy a vote in Congress? Yeah. I mean, I was pro Second Amendment whether they gave me money or not. You know what? You follow me on that? Yeah. Okay, but isn't it possible? I mean, hypothetically, I think it could definitely happen where someone gives you more money than another party that have disagreeing views to win over a vote, and then that politician or whatever wins that yeah. can see absolutely that could happen Don. um bill gates uh used to he doesn't anymore bill gates used to give an even amount of money to republicans and democrats to cover his ass you know what i mean now he just gets the benefit but big business today is with the Democrats. it's weird this has changed because you go back 20 years guys big business was with the republicans now the chamber of commerce they're with the Democrats. Okay. Um, it's it's weird. The whole thing is turning. We're going to get into this before the election. We'll talk about modern politics, what's going on. It's really interesting. I mean, like Trump, like changed everything. It's weird. Okay. And to see it happening live and in person as a government teacher, of stuff that I've talked about for decades is changing as we speak. It's pretty cool. Um, and as just as a teacher goes, you know what I mean? Uh, all right. So, yeah. Uh, so now the money is everywhere. So and then he goes on. Uh, the second expedient here is as impracticable as the first would be unwise. As long as this is great. As long as the reason of man continues fallible. And he is at liberty to exercise it. Different opinions will be formed. As long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other. So, like, if you're a, if you're a recent college grad and Joe Biden just forgave a big chunk of your student loans, that's your self-interest, man. You're going to be like, I'm voting with this guy. You know what I mean? And we see this all the time. Um, so, I think... The influence here is when Madison's talking about this division in our country, these factions that are formed, they are completely natural. Okay. Um, and the Supreme Court has, has recognized this that you can't limit pe people's speech, you can't limit their freedoms like this. And so the money is crazy, guys. It, it is amazing uh, how much money is in on this. And um, you know, my wife and I uh, have given the campaign, uh, given the causes to interest groups. Um, some of your families may have given to, like, Kansas for Life or something like that. 
Um, there's a strength in numbers, okay? And so you find the factions that align with your interests, and you support those, and you try and get people elected that support those ideas, and then they take them to Topeka, they take those ideas to Washington, and hopefully they make good decisions for the country, okay? Whether the money's there or not, that's going to happen, okay? So uh, I know it's ugly. It stinks to high heaven, all this money. But the cure is worse than the disease. The cure is worse than the disease. Okay. All right, that was beautiful. James Madison. James Madison. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? I have a lot. All right, let's go. 51. James Madison, 51. Oh, this is where he has that really pretty. What is he talking about? What's the main thesis of 51? What? Motives of men, okay. Checks and balances, okay. And, okay, this one thing you guys are gonna have to learn to differentiate the difference between checks and balances and separation of powers. Okay. Remember when we talked about parliamentary systems versus presidential systems? When I said Barack Obama, when he was a senator, ran for president. When he became president, he could no longer be in the Senate. You can't do both. There's separate powers. Okay. So the legislative makes the laws, controls the purse. The executive enforces the laws, carries out the laws judicial branch interprets the Constitution and the law and the actions of government. Yes? This, is, this prevents abuse of power, concentration of power. The checks and balances allow one, and this is the key word, the checks and balances is this. One branch is able to restrain the powers of other branches. See the difference? Okay. Now, in all this fear over this strong central government, remember, we're writing these papers to convince people that we need to adopt this new constitution. So what Madison is describing here is that the executive cannot become like a monarch. He cannot become like a king because of the separation of powers and checks and balances. If the, if the president violates the Constitution, what can Congress do? Impeach, okay? Now, the power of judicial review is not here yet. As Madison, or excuse me, Hamilton talks about in 78. But we got to talk about 54 first, right? 54 deals with that unpleasant conversation. Yes? The three-fifths compromise? Let's go to the last paragraph of that one on page 48. Or the second to last paragraph. Now, when 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 you read this, did you get a certain type of tone, Madison, on this? Did you get a, like a feeling about it? Yes, I try to be clear. He's, yeah, he's tone a difficult line. It's almost melancholy. It's it's a little bit sad. You know. Um, I don't know, that's how I, I, kind of, I read this and I'm like, it's kind of sad. Uh, it may be replied, perhaps, that slaves are not included in the estimate for rep of representatives in, in any of the, uh, the states possessing them. 
they neither vote themselves nor increase their votes of their masters. Upon what principle then ought they be taken into federal estimate over representation? In rejecting them altogether, the Constitution would, in this respect, have followed the very laws which have been appealed to as a proper guide. Let the case of the slaves be considered as it is, in truth, a peculiar one. Let the compromising expedient of the Constitution be mutually adopted with regards to them as inhabitants, but as debased by servitude below the equal level of free inhabitants, which re regards the slave as divested of two-fifths of the man. And then 78. What's he talking about? The judicial branch. And what about the judicial branch? Huh? Yeah, aren't they supposed to be like kind of like co-equal branches of government? Something like that? But Hamilton's talking about how this branch, they're getting shot. You guys know when... Uh, the first government was established under this constitution. The Supreme Court didn't have its own building. They have their own building now. Okay. You know where they met? No. In the unfinished basement of the U.S. Capitol. You went to the basement? Yeah. Well, I got to go see the Estes, and she had this little, yeah. like, Representative wife necklace thing, and she could like flash it at any of the security people, uh -huh. and just let us go wherever. She had the pin. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. That is sweet. Um, and that's where they hit on the on January sixth, right? A lot of them went down in the basement. Uh, I had a girl do an interview for history with somebody that was there on January sixth in the building. Uh, she just started working for um, Tracy Mann, who represents the 1st District of Kansas. It's like their first week. I mean, he just got elected. Was, they'd been there for like three days. And then this, you know, the breach on the Capitol happened. And so she interviewed her from this project in, in history. And um, she said, yeah, they all went down to the basement. And um, they were down there for like eight hours. Okay. Some people were scared. She said they weren't really scared. They were just confused about what was going on. Because um, you can get out. There's a there's a tunnel. You can get out of the Capitol underground. Okay, and many people did. Uh, yeah. Yeah, secret tunnels. Yeah, there's a tunnel. Yeah. The swamp. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that was a really interesting interview. Um, but anyhow, the judiciary guys really doesn't get this power of what's called judicial review. You've all heard of judicial review. Uh, Ferris did his job, right? Judicial review. Okay. There was a Supreme Court case in 1803. Because remember, John Jay, like he quits. He's the first chief justice. He's like, this job sucks. I don't get to do anything. So he quit. He had a sweet job for life. He went on to become governor of New York. Okay, John Jay did. Okay. 1803, what's the name of the Supreme Court case? Sarah knows it. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew it. I don't know. Bingston? Very important. Let's. Uh, I knew you knew it, and all of you knew it. You just couldn't think of it. Somewhere in that long-term memory. 1803, Chief Justice John Marshall, okay? And what they decide here is that, yes, in fact, in part due to this Federalist paper, okay? Guys, if you are going to be a federal judge or a Supreme Court justice, you need to read these. Because these, guys, the Constitution is a very small document. You understand? It's not very long. So it doesn't go into a lot of detail. 
You know what does? 85 essays on the Constitution. So you, this has been used. These Federalist Papers have been used to make decisions by the Supreme Court many times over. These are the third most important documents in American history behind the Constitution, the Declaration. Federalist Papers are very important. In fact, the, un, the anti-Federalist Papers are important as well. If you're going to be a federal judge, you need to read all of them. And by the way, guys, there are the anti-Federalist Papers. You just don't hear about them because they lost. Okay? People like Henry Clinton, Patrick Henry, uh, they, wrote, they wrote stuff in the newspaper, too, against this Constitution. And made some, like we said the other day, made some really good arguments, like about the Bill of Rights. Okay? So um, this case gives them judicial review. Now, think about this. If uh, you're thinking about our three branches today, okay, think about what you know about our government. Which of the three branches would you say today is the most powerful? The legislator, legislature, the executive, or the judicial? Which one do you think the founders wanted to be the strong? The legislator, the one closest to the people. Which one's the strongest today? What would you say? Let's vote. Let's vote. Let's be Democrat. Okay? You get one vote. How many people say the legislative branch is the strongest today? Don't look around. Peer pressure. No, it's okay. How many people say the executive and the president? How many people say the judicial? Joanna, you have to vote. Get off the fence. Okay. Now, it's not, it's not for sure, but I, I know a lot, so I'm going to say it's for sure. The judicial branch, guys, these people, they're not, they're not even elected. They're selected. And how long do they serve? And they get to determine whether the laws of one are constitutional or not, and the actions of the other, whether they're constitutional or not. That's a lot of power. Okay. And then I'd say the executive is next. Like, none of you put your hands up. Guys, legis our Congress, they don't like to make tough decisions. And nobody knows who they are. So, unless it's an election time, you know what I mean? Nobody pays attention to what Estes is doing on a daily basis. But they all know what Biden's doing. Biden, Biden has the bully pulpit, as, as uh, what's his name said? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt. This is the bully pulpit. The media focuses on the president. So if we, you know, it's like this guy that's running for Congress and uh, for the Senate in Ohio, Tim Ryan, he's a Democrat. Dude, who's Joe Biden? I don't, I don't know who that is. You know what I mean? He's running away from Biden because if he, like, attaches himself to the president, you know, it's not good for him right now. Okay. Now, if Biden was really popular right now, he'd be like, hey, Joe, come in, campaign for me, you know, that sort of thing. Not many Democrats are doing that right now. Okay. It's just, a, it's politics. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. There's, there's five Federalist Papers, guys, of 85. Um, now, the two most important states that these are focusing on are Virginia and New York. So you need nine states, right, to ratify? You got to have Virginia, guys. You know what I mean? And Patrick Henry is not liking this. Uh, but Madison, Jefferson, they like it. Washington definitely likes it. Um, and then New York, these essays are published in New York, and um, they, will have, they will have sweat. These federal papers are going to work, okay? So eventually, actually, all 13... Uh, will ratify. Uh, the ninth state to ratify is New Hampshire, another small state. Uh, so once New Hampshire ratifies, uh, we adopt a new constitution. Okay? And uh, we're going to start a new government in New York. We're going to elect a president and a vice president and our first Congress. And you know who the first speaker of the House is going to be? This is the most powerful person in the United States House of Representatives that controls the purse. 
Treasury. Hamilton's going to be Treasury. Good. Jefferson's going to come back and be State. Remember, the anti federalists wanted a Bill of Rights. The Federalists said they're not necessary because the states have Bills of Rights, right? James Madison is going to be the first Speaker of the House, and he, in part, will be the author of the Bill of Rights as the Speaker of the House because these first 10 amendments will be proposed by Congress, okay, and then ratified by the states. They'll actually propose 12 amendments. And will be ratified. Okay, that will be the Bill of Rights. And Madison, I think we can credit as the author, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I'll explain that later. One of them would make it eventually. The 27th, proposed in 1789, ratified in 1986. Yeah. That's a good story. Okay, um, tomorrow, uh, what do we got? Let me see what I got left in my notes. Okay, this is what we got to do. We're ratif we've ratified the Constitution, okay? Now, we're going to study the basics of the Constitution tomorrow with a focus. That's the first, there's seven articles, okay? The first three are the three branches. Article one takes up these first two columns, guys. Over the legislative branch. Okay. Then you get the executive, judicial, and then the four here. Um, we're going to focus on Article 4 tomorrow, which is interstate and international relations. Okay, which we learn a lot tomorrow. Um, then we're going to look at the amendment process a little deeper. Then we're going to take a day or two and we're going to learn all 27 amendments. It'll be fun. Yeah, I got a, I got a little exercise that I do that'll be different than my normal teaching. Okay, change it up a little bit. I know that's scary. Okay, and then um, then I have a day on federalism, the division, sharing of power between national, state, and local governments. Uh, we got to talk about checks and balances in a little more detail, and then we're done. So. And I have a video as well um, on the Constitution. Uh, so today is Wednesday. Maybe by next Friday. Do we have a full week next Friday, next week? Yes. Maybe by next Friday. We'll have a test. Okay. We'll see. All right. Um, I'm going to give you guys some points for this discussion, but not a ton. Um, and there is a homework assignment in here too, but we'll wait. There's two homework assignments, here, but we got to wait till we talk about stuff first. So there is going to be some opportunities for some points. Good. Good. Have a good one. Send me a message. Um. They send me text man. I've never I looked at the website thing the uh -huh. other day and it said Wednesday, but I thought you said Monday. Okay. Then there's like only one meeting on the calendar that I actually looked at the points of Spangles. Okay. You've never actually been? No. Oh, I assume this is No, I I mean like I got on their email list and their text yeah. messages and I went to Topeka that one time. Yeah. Uh and I went to one meeting. Uh, they wanted me to be like a, a regional captain or something. You know? I, I don't know if I got time to do that. Um, but if you contact them, like they have like their website, they'll send you some information. Okay. Yeah, just contact them. Yeah. So you guys were talking about that at home? Yeah, we talk about politics a lot. And that, like, I go to the pool places with my parents pretty much every time I have an election. Okay. And every time, well, now that I have a job, 